onto this earth, that you have loved us enough um, to come as yourself, um, to take up a cross so that we might be reconciled to you forever. Because God knows we could never do this on our own. But out of this love that you have, you looked at us, you stretched out your arms, and you gave your life. Father, uh, give us ears to hear the message that you have delivered to Pastor Joe today. Your word tells us that the flowers fade and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Father, give us ears to hear your word today in the name of your son. Amen. You may be seated. Man, it is so good to see everybody here today. Uh, this is actually like the first like Sunday of summer, it feels like outside, right? It's pretty hot, and uh, I'm glad the air conditioners uh, work well in this building. All five of them are cranking it out. Uh, listen, we're continuing our series on 2 Corinthians. As you guys know, we like to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the scripture. And we only have uh, about five, maybe four weeks left of 2 Corinthians, so we're almost through that. And then after that, we're going to do a series on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The main reason we're doing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is because it's not about David, and it's not about Paul, which is pretty much where we've been stuck for like two years, right, with those two guys. So we're going to move on from those. But today's sermon is called Righteous Chutzpah. Yes, that's a good title, isn't it? Say, Pastor Joe, that's a good title right there. I say, yeah, 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 very good, thank you. <clears throat> so let me tell you what chutzpah is. So that was my Sunday sermon preview on, the, on social media for those of you that follow it. The definition of chutzpah is, un, I love this, unmitigated effrontery. That's great, isn't it? Impudence, gall, audacity, and nerve. <clears throat> See, it's hard for me to preach on that because none of that applies to my personality, and it's very difficult, so I'm going to try to relate to you through that. Um, so often, what happens is this type of quality is considered arrogant, right? Negative. Some think it embodies rudeness, maybe, or even, you know, a level of disrespect. But in fact... It's central to a church being able to make Heavenly Dad smile, but it comes with a price. Now understand, when I say righteous chutzpah, I'm not talking about just dropping truth bombs on people and walking away like, boom, showed you, bam. <laughs> it's not what I'm talking about. But if you want to fulfill, and this is important, church, if you want to fulfill your role in God's kingdom, as a Christian, as a child of God, you have to understand this concept that I'm going to share with you today. Our passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, not 15. Sorry about that. Um, here's what it says. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. He says it twice. Like, listen, I'm going to talk to you again about this, and I really want you to hear me. No, 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 no. Listen, I mean it. Hear me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to, pr to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. And he says that with some, you know, sarcasm. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. You can see a little bit of chutzpah, right, in what Paul is saying. And the concept here is Paul is saying, listen to me. I have earned the right to speak with you, again, even if it seems like it's something foolish. So listen carefully to me. So you guys know normally what we do is we take a passage and we break it down. What's the history of the passage? What's the theology? And what's the devotional application? I'm going to change what I call these sections. It will kind of be the same, but I want to make them... So I know sometimes we're tempted to, okay, get the history and theology done so we can talk about the devotional side. And I want to change it so it's all more interesting to you. So starting this week, the historical is going to be called the cultural. And what I mean by cultural is simply this. What were the people at the time feeling? What were they experiencing? 
how were they reacting to what was going on in their life. And this week, the cultural aspect is, I kind of titled it, Caught in the Middle, because that's what's going on with the Corinthians. This is the cultural side of what's going on with this passage. So first of all, I want you to understand the Corinthians were a juicy target. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, Corinth is far away from Jerusalem where the church started. And they really have no personal historical context as to what happened in Jerusalem with Jesus several years earlier. They weren't there. There was no YouTube to see it. It wasn't streamed live on Twitter. The only thing that they knew about Jesus and the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection is what Paul and his team brought to them. They weren't there. So the only historical context is that from Paul. Then false teachers realize, you know, you know what? These Corinthians, they have a lot of money. There would be big profit in targeting them for our own gain. If we can go in there, Paul, he did his thing. He started a church. It's going good. He's gone. Let's come behind him and let's bring our own message. Maybe we can develop kind of a following. And all of this together makes them a ripe, easy target for all types of wolves and scoundrels that want to come in and teach them false theology so that they can benefit financially. And the Corinthians, honestly, they had it coming from all sides. I mean, what do we believe? Is Paul lying to us? Are these new people lying? Who are we supposed to believe here? And everyone with a spiritual message wants to cash in on the Corinthians with whatever rhetoric works. So that's them. They're a juicy target. And then we see that there is a passionate devotion. Why was Paul so concerned? I mean, really, why was it? What drove such an emotional, bold group of letters from Paul to the Corinthians? I mean, he saw precious Corinth as his, one of his greatest labors of love, much time, much money, much sweat, much tears were invested in their spirituality. He was used by God to bring the gospel to them first in selfless service in every way. And because of that, because he has this passionate devotion, because of his incredible investment into who they are as a church, God had given Paul a tremendous love for them, a jealous love. He says, I'm jealous of you because I'm the one that brought you the gospel. I'm the one that presented to you to Christ as a bride is presented to her husband. So therefore, I'm jealous of the fact that other people are coming behind me and teaching you this false gospel. So that's the passionate devotion part of the cultural aspect. And then there, the response to this is a bold action on Paul's response. Paul's passion, his history with Corinth, and his faith in truth results in a natural, bold, righteous, chutzpah kind of love for them. Does that make sense? Like, he is not going to hold back. He's going to say what he needs to say. He's going to tell them what they need to hear. And he knows he's earned the right to not have to worry about how it might be received because they know who he is. It is manifested in a righteous, earned boldness to speak truth and love. And this was, frankly, his normal MO. As a matter of fact, he said the same thing to the Ephesians. Look what he says in Ephesians chapter 4. And he says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You see what he's talking about there? The same types of false teachers. Rather, speaking the truth in love, there's the idea, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So you can see he was bold with the Ephesians too. This is what's Paul's M.O., he would go into a place, he would spend a lot of time there, invest a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and money, not asking them for any money. He would go, being supported by other people, start these churches, invest in them, and that gave him the right to have righteous chutzpah with them. 
So that's the historical or the cultural aspect. Let's talk about the spiritual. That used to be called the theological. What about God and what did he do? I'm changing that. So the spiritual really means now, what are the timeless God-breathed spiritual truths at play? Because see, what, what makes us able to connect to the people back in that culture, back in that day, is that in the middle there's this God that never changes. And so we can look at the scripture through the eyes and the concept of the way God dealt with them is the way he deals with us. That's why there is a devotional application for us. So this is the, new, the, the, the spiritual side of it. As we saw in last week's passage, and again this week, Paul understood his crucial job of defending the gospel, especially within his authority as an apostle. He understood this was his calling, no matter what the cost, this was his job. So what he does in this passage, he gives them a quick summary of what to watch for from these fame and fortune-seeking false teachers. So here are the attacks on the gospel. The first one is, he says, if anybody comes to you and tells you about a different Jesus, what's he talking about? He's talking about the historical part of Jesus. Because what we have to understand is without the historical Jesus that we know of, the gospel's just a fairy tale. It's a fantasy. It's a fake story. And what was happening is these false teachers would bring historical misinformation, a different story, a different result. The crucifixion didn't go quite as way, the way Paul told you. The resurrection wasn't quite what Paul said. It really wasn't a resurrection. There would be a number of ways they would try to change the actual historical account of what Jesus went through from every aspect. False teachers were going so far as to challenge the actual historical accounts of Jesus, even back then. Today, that's one of the big things. Oh, you know, this thing, Jesus, Jesus probably didn't really even exist. The fact of the matter is, Jesus is one of the most historically proven people in human history. But there are people who try to say, eh, that historical Jesus, that's not really the Jesus that's part of the gospel. And matter of fact, some would even say he didn't really die. He was just an inspirational legend. The resurrection wasn't real, it was staged. Or he did all this as an object lesson. Yes, he died, but he didn't have to die for your sins. He chose to die for your sins just so you would know how far you should be willing to go. Even early on in Jerusalem, people tried to say that the resurrection was staged by the disciples. So that attack on the historical Jesus goes way back to day one. It's nothing new. So he says, look, if somebody brings you a different Jesus, reject them. If somebody brings you a different spirit, and what I mean by spirit, without the Holy Spirit, the gospel is powerless. You understand that? It's not just that we have this gospel about Christ dying on the cross and being resurrected so we don't have to pay for the penalty for our sin. It's not just the message. It's the message combined with the power of the Holy Spirit that enlightens us and gives us the gift of faith. faith. See, he says, someone comes with a different Jesus, ignore them. A different spirit. If there's a different power for living, a different source of gifts for different reasons. Matter of fact, one of the things out there, that Holy Spirit you guys love, he's not just for Christians. Remember the struggles they were having in 1 Corinthians? They had these spiritual gifts they were doing and they were going and speaking in tongues and all these things with pagans. People didn't even believe in God. And Paul had to explain what these spiritual gifts were for in 1 Corinthians 13. They were engaging in charismatic worship services with pagan temple worshipers. Because false teachers have said, it's the same spirit. Whether you're Christian, or pagan, or Hindu, or whatever it is you want, it's all the same spirit. He says, if it's a different spirit, don't listen. And he says, if it's a different gospel. And what I mean by that is this, without purity of the message of redemption, the gospel is pointless. I mean, the whole point of the gospel is that it's about us being redeemed. Theological corruption. A different understanding of what God has done and how he did it. Like, for example, Jesus died for your sins, but you still need the temple to complete your redemption. You still need religion. You still got to be good. You still got to follow the laws of Judaism was an example. Or Jesus died for everyone. And you don't have to follow him to get the eternal benefits. 
Or another one they would share, Jesus is a way, but not the way. So Paul says if it's a different Jesus, a different spirit, or a different gospel, you've already entertained it, don't entertain it anymore. So now let's go to the next, the last final application of this passage, what used to be called the devotional. I'm changing it to personal. How can these cultural and eternal spiritual concepts affect my life today? That's the idea behind this. And I call this chutzpah love. I love saying that word, just chutzpah, 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 chutzpah. What are you having for dinner tonight? Chutzpah. And gravy, chutzpah and gravy, it's delicious. So listen, we as a church should endeavor to have righteous chutzpah love for our town, just like Paul had for Corinth. But to do that, to have this gall, this, this nerve, this confidence, this boldness, there are some obstacles we have to overcome to have righteous chutzpah. And usually the biggest obstacle is fear. And I've outlined, I think, some of the biggest fears that keep us from having righteous chutzpah. First of all, we might think that uh, our truth isn't enough. It means we are afraid of other people's opinion of what we believe. Truth needs some modern help. We need ways to mask the gospel and shape it and make it culturally palatable for those who have never heard it. We need to change it. We need, we need to change its trajectory just a little bit. As a matter of fact, this week I, I learned of another tragic story of a well-known church in our community with incredibly rich heritage for preaching the gospel. They've gone sour on truth. And they've said, we don't want our preaching to be kept in a box anymore. So we're not going to be preaching the Old Testament any longer. It's not relevant. You don't need it. For those that were here for Psalm 119 for 137 weeks in a row, you know that's not true. Right? And the gospel preaching only puts our message in a box. It keeps us from being the church that we can truly be. And Jesus is just one way, not the way. And he didn't have to die. He died as an object lesson, not for our sins. And this church that had a tremendous legacy and heritage has, has begun to preach this every week. Because they believe the truth isn't enough anymore. We've got to add to it. So that's one fear, that the reason we might change the gospel and not have righteous chutzpah is because we don't think that truth is enough. Another reason is our mission isn't really that critical. It's a failure to understand the role we have. I mean, who else is going to do this job of preaching the message of hope and love and redemption in Christ? I mean, Paul knew it was on him. Matter of fact, he said this in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. I'll just read it to you. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who they have not ever heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And Paul makes it very clear, this is our mission. This is our job. We are to share the message of love, grace, mercy, hope, and redemption through the work of Christ on the cross. But when we don't believe our mission is critical, we begin to slack off a little bit. Yeah, the gospel is important, but there's other things we need to do. We need to build big church programs, or we need to do this, or we need to do... And what begins to happen is churches easily get distracted from the main purpose of the church, which is to preach the gospel. Amen. You know what else happens? What else gets in the way of righteous chutzpah love? Our fear of rejection. Or maybe failure. We become afraid of rejection or loss of credibility or popularity. It's why churches compromise the gospel today. Therefore, the timing of this week's passage is really perfect. Because I can tell you the most important thing 
I can do, we can do, is show love in speaking truth boldly. But there's more to that than we'll get to in just a minute. But I love this passage in John 4, uh, 1 John 4, 18 and 19, one of the books we're going to be studying after this one's done. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Boldness comes from love. Not from knowledge, not from arrogance. It comes from understanding what true love is. And true love is this. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Christ did for us. And through that love, we can have boldness and fear be cast out and have confidence in our truth, have confidence in our calling, and not be afraid of rejection or failure. So my question is, how, how we show hoods below? I mean, what do we do? See, once we understand the greatest love is relentlessly earning the privilege to show Righteous chutzpah. Let me explain. Our genuine love for those that we are called to shepherd should drive us to do basically three things. First one, we accept our responsibility. Guys, we cannot shy away <clears throat> from truth. Paul knew his role as an apostle was to speak boldly. We must embrace that role God has for his church today. We, according to what Paul said in Romans, we are the connection between him and and a hurting world that is looking for purpose and redemption and healing. We are the connector. How will they hear without a preacher? And not just a preacher like me, like all of us. How committed are we to our responsibility, to our calling? How much is that calling really worth? How much money should we spend doing it? Paul put a really high price on it, by the way. He sacrificed almost everything he ever had so that he could take the message of hope and redemption to Corinth. So that's number one. We have to accept our responsibility. No one else is going to do it for us. Not town hall, not Washington, D.C., not late night talk show hosts, not the news, not the newspaper. There's only one group that can connect people with a loving God, and that's those who have been given the gift of faith, the trust, the truth of the gospel. Amen. So we have that. Accept our responsibility. Then we have to trust God's truth. By the way, trusting God's truth is a result of how intelligent you are, right? <laughs> no. It's the gift of faith. See, not trusting the truth is antithetical to faith. But see, the gospel is the most important truth we can share. It proves our love for our community more than anything else we can do. We must be dedicated to God's word and have chutzpah to share it because that truth trumps all other forms of truth. And you must be comfortable with that. We don't need to adjust it. We don't need to contextualize it. We don't need to culturalize it. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to mix it with other gospels. We have a good one. But the last one is the most important part. And this is what Paul did before he showed righteous chutzpah in verses 1 through 6. There was something else he did, and that is he earned the privilege. The same passionate devotion Paul had for Corinth, we must have it for Sarasota. You understand, we must have more passion for Sarasota than we do building an institution called Grace Life. Do you understand that? Like, yes, we want our church to grow. We want it to get stronger. We want it to get, you know, we, we want that. But you know what? Our main passion should be we want to take the message of hope and redemption to our town. And that is more important than building an institution. We continually earn the privilege of righteous hoods beloved with sacrifice. Surprising generosity, love, compassion, and all those give us the right to speak with righteous chutzpah. It's kind of arrogant to speak with righteous chutzpah without earning it first. And you know, you have a team here in this church who's extremely active every day almost of every week. It's our mercy team. They're meeting with people constantly, giving away thousands of dollars of food and help and things like that in our church. They are out there earning Grace Life's privilege to have righteous chutzpah. 
They are your legs and feet out there taking what you give here on Sunday morning and making sure the people that get it aren't abusing us, but they are in need and they need help and they need an opportunity to hear the message of hope and redemption. And they're out there working diligently for that to take place. That's just one example. We have Day of Hope coming up. We do it there. There are a lot of ways that our church is, is working diligently to earn the privilege of righteous chutzpah. Just as Paul did, we must relentlessly serve for the privilege of speaking bold truth. I mean, that's what he did. That's what we must do to have this righteous chutzpah. Because here's what it comes down to. We are called to relentlessly earn the privilege of loving Sarasota with this boldness, with this righteous chutzpah. We are called to relentlessly serve them so we have the privilege of saying, can you, do, can you just bear with me again, please? I, I, I know you've heard this before, but we've earned the right to tell you can, you, can I just tell you about Christ again? You see how that works? Righteous chutzpah comes from serving relentlessly. Are you in for that? That's where we need to be as a church. So, that's what I have for you on the sermon side, but I want to say something that's a little bit related to this. Um, Grace Life is about, let me see, October 12, November, December, January, February. Now. We're like 17 months old. And one of our uh, church planners that helped us start this was Pastor Daryl Davis. Y'all, everybody look in the back and embarrass him. Just wave your hand, Daryl and Deb. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, turn around. He's embarrassed. Don't look at him. So, so I just want to say, this is Daryl's, Daryl and Deb Davis, their last Sunday with us. So they're moving up to uh, North Pole, <laughs> Pennsylvania, same thing. All right, so um, they're moving up there. It's where Daryl was from, when he, where he grew up. Uh, but Daryl has spent almost his whole professional life as a pastor serving relentlessly Sarasota, for the right to have righteous chutzpah. He's done funerals. He's done weddings. He's done sermons. He's been an associate pastor for virtually all those years. He's done some interim work when pastors left their churches or, lost or got fired or whatever. He would step in and provide pulpit service and love for churches. And then he retired. Then I yanked him out of retirement. And now he's a church planter. He has done so much to earn the privilege of righteous chutzpah in our community. He's a coach for me almost every week. I send him my notes. We talk it out, make sure I'm going the right direction. It's been a huge blessing to me as a friend and a brother in Christ. I think he might be one of the best cooks in town, if I'm not mistaken. He's really good. Deb, is that right? He, the man can cook. The man can cook. But um, we were so privileged to have him a part of this really strange church for a year and a half. I can tell you we couldn't have done it without him. And now he's going up to Pennsylvania and he's gonna bless people up there. And I just wanted this opportunity for us as a church, uh, Deb and Daryl, to thank you both for the time that you spent with us. We love you. So, so what Daryl said is, you know, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't have everybody look at me. And I said, Daryl, sorry. They need to tell you how much they love you and appreciate what you've done to help us start this church. So on the way out today, stick a little money in his pocket. No. Uh, if you've had the chance to get to know Daryl, give him a hug and thank him for his tireless service in our community. Since 1902, is that right, Daryl? You've been here since? <laughs> He's been here a long time. He's impacted a lot of people, and I am not the least of which. Matter of fact, the first time my wife and I needed marriage counseling was with Daryl. Did you know that? It worked. We're still together, so good job, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Dad, we just want to thank you so much for truth that we can have confidence in. We thank you so much for the calling you've given us. And we thank you that you've given us the right and the privilege to earn diligently, relentlessly through service 
and love the opportunity to have righteous chutzpah for our town. We thank you for Pastor Darrell and the blessing he's been to so many tens of thousands of people in our community for a long time. Thank you for the privilege it's been given to Grace Life to have him part of our team for the time he's been here. And as him and Deb get ready to uh, transition away from Sarasota back up to Pennsylvania, I pray that you would give them opportunities to continue to encourage the body of Christ there. We're so thankful for what you're doing in our church. And we pray that you'll help us to continue to stay focused on earning the privilege of righteous chutzpah. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you guys so much. Have a great, great Sunday afternoon. We'll see you here next week.